A warm welcome to the 8th Biennial Conference on Ports and Shipping. At the onset, we would like to begin with thanking all our sponsors for this conference, with whose support this day has been made possible. Our platinum sponsor, Mumbai Port Trust. Our gold sponsor, Jawaharlal Nehru Port Trust. Our bronze sponsors are Adani Ports and APM Terminals. Hospitality sponsors, Haropa Ports and the Seahorse Crew. Our delegated sponsor, K-Line, and all other sponsors, that is MSC Agency and NYK Line. This conference shall aim at sharing best international practices, identifying vital changes needed in the maritime industry, creating awareness regarding viable investment and operating models for ports and shipping, suggesting innovation in total logistic management, ensuring a reasonable return to investors in the maritime industry, and fostering socially responsible business. To begin with the proceedings, we'd like to invite Captain Anil Singh, the chairman of this conference, and also the senior VP and MDVP world to say a few words. Good morning, all. I realize it's, uh, it's a bit early, but I'm sure uh, they'll give you a cup of coffee to start so that we all come awake. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, to this eighth biennial conference on shipping and ports. Honorable Dr. Abdul Kalam, the former, former president of India, is the chief guest for today's conference and will be joining us later this morning. The focus of this year's conference is shipping industry in times of economic change. We in the industry realize that, I won't say difficult times, it is different times. Uh, the previous years we have seen ups, downs, and people kept saying, okay, the downturn is, I hope it's a V. And somebody said, oh, it's gone a bit longer, it may be a U. Somebody said, well, we have seen the change, the shipping has come up again, and it falls, and somebody says it's a W. And I kept wondering, I hope it's not a bathtub. On a brighter note, I think the year has started well for the shipping industry. We are looking up after a few years of a downturn. The question is how do we then take advantage of the upward swing? Today, India contributes to less than 1% of world trade. How can we become uh, an economic powerhouse. With such a small trade taking place to the most economical mode of transport, why couldn't India become like Singapore, a hub? With such a vast coastline, uh, why don't we have more ports? Why don't we have more infrastructure? And those are the questions that will be deliberated during the course of the day. We have some very learned panelists, and I'm sure that uh, you will be better informed as well as you will enjoy the interaction uh, during the course of the day. Looking at ports, India is in critical need of world-class port infrastructure. We have major ports, we have minor ports, we have private ports, yet our port capacity suffers. We are behind the eight ball, as they call it. We have some of the largest waterways around the country. Yet, we have a minimal infrastructure for inland waterways. In India, we are transporting maximum cargo by road. 
we are burning fossil fuels. We have an environment aspect to be looked into. And I keep saying to people that what are we going to tell our next generation as far as leaving a clean environment is concerned? We have a responsibility today. Why is coastal shipping not successful in India? There are various reasons for this. Lack of smaller ports, delay on part of policymakers, and what is required is that all the decision makers to come together, whether it is the government, the private sector, the users, to put their heads together and find out a solution to <coughs> a better infrastructure for shipping and ports. In today's forum, there will be a healthy discussion. And as I said earlier on, uh, our panelists are very eminent persons who, have, who bring to you a wealth of knowledge. And without further ado, I would leave the floor to our first panel. I'll hand it over to the compares. Thank you very much. We now commence with the first interactive session for this day. We welcome all our panel members. Our moderator, Mr. Michael Pinto. Mr. Michael Pinto has had an illustrious career in Indian civil service for over three decades. He was the Director General of Shipping and helped formulate the national shipping policy that encouraged private investments in the Indian maritime sector. As the Chairman of Jain Port, he was instrumental in the tremendous growth and investments in the ports. Mr. Pinto has also held the post of Secretary of the Shipping Ministry. We welcome you, Mr. Pinto. Our next panelist, panelist is Mr. Deepak Shetty, a direct recruit member of the 1980 batch of the Indian Revenue Service. Mr. Deepak Shetty is assigned the position of Joint DG as the Director General of Shipping since April 2011. He, he has represented at various international forums such as IMO and UN. In addition to many honors, he has received Presidential Award of Appreciation Certificate for Specially Distinguished Record of Service. We welcome you, Mr. Shetty. Our next panel member is Mr. Hajra, a postgraduate in business management from IIM Kolkata. Mr. Hajra has been the president of INSA for a consecutive five years. He was also director and vice president of the International Shipping Federation, the most important ship owners forum in the world, which represents the shipowning <laughs> fraternity in ILO, IMO, and other UN bodies. He served at Shipping Corporation of India as chairman and managing director from the year 2005 to 2012. We welcome you, Mr. Hasra. Our next panel member is Mr. Agarwal. An LLB and a fellow member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, Mr. Atul Agrawal is associated with Mercator Line as its promoter and managing director. Mr. Agarwal has been on advisory board to Maharashtra Maritime Board, trustees of the Mumbai Port Trust, president of INSA, and director at Indian Register of Shipping. Welcome, Mr. Agarwal. The next panel member is Captain Deepak Tiwari. Captain Tiwari has started his sea career with the Shipping Corporation of India in the year 1972 after passing out from T.S. Dufferin. In the year 2001, Captain Tiwari joined MSC to take charge as CEO MSC India, a responsibility he holds till date. He successfully completed the Global Leaders Program at Duke's University USA in 2007. Since 2008, Captain Tiwari has been serving as the chairman of Container Shipping Lines Association, an eminent association of container shipping lines operating in India, which is presently has around 34 member companies. Welcome, Captain Tiwari. And we have another panel member, Mr. Julian Bevis. 
Mr. Julian Bevis, a British national holding a master's degree from Oxford University, started his career as a management trainee in October 1971 at Overseas Containers Limited. Today, at the Merce Group, Julian is a senior director, group relations in South Asia, where he is responsible for all government, regulatory, and major stakeholder matters. At the start of this panel discussion, we'd like to invite Mr. Anil Singh to present our panelists a token of our appreciation. Mr. Michael Pinto. In line with Bombay Chamber's Green Initiative, we've started presenting tree certificates instead of bouquets. This tree certificate ensures that a grow of 10 trees is planted on the barren lands of Amravati district of Maharashtra. Mr. S. Hasra, Mr. Atul Agarwal, Mr. Atul Agarwal, Captain, Captain Deepak Tiwari, Mr. Julian Bevis and Mr. Deepak Shetty. Over to you, Mr. Pinto. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had a very good introductory session, and I thought I would start the session by laying down a few rules, but I also call to your attention this little quotation. Don't worry about it for the moment. What we'll do is we'll have a system, a seminar system in which uh, we will ask questions. I will ask questions from different panelists. You've heard how distinguished they all are. So we'll just ask questions, we'll get answers, and please feel free from the audience at any time, at any time, to raise your hand and ask a question or make a comment. Only two conditions. You must identify yourself, and question or comment, it should be. But at any time, please do that. If you don't do it, I might feel called upon to ask something from the audience to, to interview. Let me start out by talking about this session now. We're talking about the Indian flag, what's happened to the Indian flag, why is it that it's not so attractive? And can you please read that little uh, quotation that I have there? Uh, where do you think this came from? You think it came from the introduction to the 12th plan? You think it came from the subgroup? of the Planning Commission and the Shipping Ministry on the State of Indian Shipping? Do you think it came from uh, one of the, the conferences that we held where people have held forth on it? Where do you think it came from? Well, uh, I must tell you that this, came, this quotation comes from the, the, the committee appointed by the Government of India in, hold your breath, 1945. It was headed by the Ramaswami Mudalaya, and it is this committee, the Ramaswami Mudalaya committee, that started its, its, uh, its report with these potential words. From 45 to 2014, I won't attempt to tell you how many years have passed, but I wonder whether our, our uh, problems are very, very different. Let me start with the chairman Insa and a prominent ship owner himself, Mr. Atur Agarwal. We have seen how the Indian flag has grown or not grown over a period of time. What, in your view, constitute the major reasons why we have this present state where we are not able to grow so quickly? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. If I sound a little confused and a little sleepy, it is all thanks to the promised cup of coffee not arriving as yet. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree with you entirely. It seems I fought this problem. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so I thought this was only 23 years old, but apparently it keeps going on and off. So it appears that uh, nothing has changed for the last 70 years. So we probably believe in getting a heritage 
and uh, the forward and not changing anything. So things have not moved for the last 70 years. I don't, uh, though it is a very vexed issue about why the Indian flag is not growing and why Indian shipping is not growing. But primarily I feel that Indian flag is not exactly the friendliest in the world. Dealing with the Indian flag is not exactly extremely friendly. There definitely are better flags to deal with. And what is the attraction of Indian flag? The question that we should ask ourselves. I think we should ask ourselves two questions. FDIF for shipping was open, 100% FDIF was open for shipping way back in the 90s. Not even a single dollar has come in there. We should ask ourselves the question, why? And what would be the attraction for Indian flag? There would be two attractions. First, an access to Indian cargo. And secondly, if the flag is friendly, people don't mind flag flagging here. And if you are coupled with a situation where you have access to Indian cargo in spite of flying the foreign flag, and the Indian flag is not exactly very friendly, then you have no incentive to come to India at all. We all know that majority of the Indian cargo, maybe 90%, is carried by foreign flags. I think the government needs to insist on a policy. We have been chasing the government for the last quite a few years that on the coast, foreign flag vessels should not be permitted. The government somehow does not want to do it. If the government were to do that, we definitely would see far more Indian flag vessels than what we have currently. The normal response from the government being that there are many ships, Indian shipping, coastal shipping would suffer, I think that is unfounded. One very simple reason. 100% FDI is permitted in India. When I, as an Indian, <laughs> wants to go and let us say fly on, let us say even a country like Indonesia or Malaysia, can I do it? The answer is no. I have to fly the foreign flag, I have the local flag. 51% has to be owned locally. India is the only country in the world which permits 100% ownership. <coughs> Means a foreigner can come in India, establish an Indian company and fly their flag. Why we not insist that everything which operates on the Indian coast has to be only through the Indian flag? If any vessel. Yeah, I think Amazon is a good point. But it needs to fly the Indian flag. Yeah, let me just briefly turn to Captain Tiwari now. Uh, I think Akul has made a very interesting point. One, we've got cabotage, obviously. But I think what really struck me was he said the Indian flag is not very friendly. Captain Tiwari, you work with SCI. Now you are the head of uh, one of the largest European shipping companies in the world for India. So tell us, uh, what is your experience? Why is it not friendly? What would changes would you like to see? Yeah, answer your question, I, I would. Our company employs company is uh, manning about a hundred ships with Indian seafarers. Why shouldn't we flag our ship in India? In fact, our owner was very keen to flag a, uh, flag a ship in India, but when he did a back of the envelope calculation, he found that the operating cost on an Indian flag is about 42% higher than operating costs on a foreign flag. Now, that is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And especially in shipping, which is open to global competition, market rates are fluctuating, market rates are not commensurate with the profitability of uh, operating a ship. I mean, you, you just turn around and say, thank you very much, we continue to operate the way we are operating. And we'll continue to man our ships with Indian uh, officers and crew. The, the point here is, FDI was uh, in shipping, in Indian shipping, 
was made 100% and we are one of the first industries to get this. I think we should introspect and see as to why this is not being successful. Whereas the other sectors such as energy, telecom, telecom is just one of them, retail, etc., who have um, uh, retail where, where you have not got 100% and people are clamoring to get that 100% FDI. Is it that the Indian citizen and the Indian government does not like this FDI? Is it that we don't want it? Are we happy that 96% of your container <coughs> trade is carried by foreign flag? The foreign flag is very happy, of course. But are the Indian flag operators doing something about it? Is the Indian government doing anything about it? Is the Indian citizen doing something? I'm sorry I'm posing questions here. Yeah, that, but that's fine. I, I think these questions need to be answered by us. Yeah. So you're saying that it's a difference of 42%. Absolutely. People, would you like to comment on this? If there is really a difference of 42% in... Uh, yeah. I, there's really a difference of 42% in, uh, in the cost of tagging in India. Why is this so? What do uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and privilege to be here next to you this morning uh, to head plunge straight on to the question here. Uh, let's first look at the overall ecosystem for an industry or an entrepreneur or an enterprise in India. Because you really can't insulate uh, or isolate the shipping sector per se from the overall ambience which the industry has in the country. We gauge ourselves in, uh, let's say, two broad indices, which is the business development mix and the global investment index. We trail way, way below somewhere around the 60s and the 70s on a global scale. So clearly, notwithstanding the fact that we have come a long way since the opening of the economy for the last two or decades, we really haven't been as business friendly as we ought to have been. So coming to the specifics of uh, the question that you posed, sir, that as to what is the attributes of the <laughs> differential to the tune of around 42%, clearly one of the reasons, of course, is the operating cost in terms of the bunker, which is one. Now, from a maritime administration perspective, I may address, over the years, there has been a constant process of trying to simplify the regime and ensure to the best extent possible that there is a certain receptivity to this. I mean, I may just cite a few instances in the recent past. Now, when it comes to registration of a vessel, so that's a process which, as the Indian flag, we have quite recently, I'm sure some of you are privy to that, have uh, set about, uh, changed the rules of the game, and made it relatively simpler in comparative terms for the registration of a ship in terms of access to the mercantile marine department, whichever jurisdiction you wish to approach. Uh, similarly, uh, you have, in terms of licensing, Let's look at that as another uh, paradigm. That again, what we have proposed to the government is that as of today, you have to approach the directorate of shipping and the headquarters. That's to be farmed out to the mercantile departments. It's going to be a one-time license, coterminous with the registration, unless otherwise revoked. So that is a proposition which is awaiting the stamp of approval of the government. The third is the proposition which we have again picked up from the industry stakeholder that we need to have controlled tonnage. Now that's again something which we have moved the government and hopefully we are awaiting a positive response on that. Uh, I quite agree that notwithstanding this, there is a lot that needs to be done. Uh, I'm sure we'll open out, I think I would rather not hear from you as to what is it that you expect the maritime administration of the government to do, but clearly there is a need to bridge this gap. I'm reminded of FDI, you know, the economy is the foreign direct investment. Sometimes, you know, like when I start wondering whether it's the fiscal deficit in India that you look at in terms of the FDI. I'll just <laughs> pause at this point, sir, and I'll come back at a later stage and pick the threads from where you left. Okay. Now we've heard uh, from uh, the director of shipping sir, about uh, how this is uh, trying to tackle. Do you think that's enough? Do you think something more needs to be done? If so, what? If so, how? And if so, when? You see, I would simply say that while we have had you know, several DGs one after the other always talking about loosening the control without losing it, having the approach of green channel, red channel, controlled by you know, exceptions, and leaving it more and more on the ship owner themselves, Unfortunately, I think as Atul right in the beginning said, 
despite all these attempts, even today I think we fall far short of the really friendly flags that we come across all over the world. And the other thing, of course, which also again has been brought forward by uh, Deepak, that in today's environment, when uh, sorry, <laughs> Deepak Tiwari. Uh, that, you know, I mean, in today's environment, when every shipping company is, as Anil said, is going through whatever a difficult phase, I mean, there is no question of someone being able to look at an option which is 42% more expensive than the other. You see, India, I mean, we all know India has the cargo. We keep on saying India controls in terms of, no, I'm not talking of coastal, I'm talking of the India's overseas trade. It's 8 to 9% of the global trade. But we have only 1% of the global tonnage. We have the competence in terms of the seafaring, in terms of ship management. The world's largest ship management companies are manned by many, many Indians across the globe, not only in this part of the globe, anywhere in the world. And we also know that, uh, you know, as far as capital is concerned, it will flow anywhere where there is a facilitative regime. Despite all that, FDI hasn't come in. So that means that we have not been able to make our flag facilitative enough, our regime facilitative enough, neither, neither by giving any you know, preferential access to our flag for at least our cargo. You know, in Brazil also, every ship owner who has operated in Brazil, they know that the, in Brazil also the operating cost is far, far higher than the international regime. But nevertheless, people, in a way, are still prepared to go to Brazil because they know without going there, they won't have the access to that cargo. We can all talk about, you know, that any kind of protectionism leads to inefficiency, leads to higher cost. In pure and simple economic theories, there is nothing to debate on that. But I keep saying that this so-called leisure fair, complete free economy is an utopic idea. If Indian ship owners cannot access to the trade of Indonesia, Malaysia, even Middle East, without having a you know, majority stake from the local local uh, ship owners, local uh, you know partners, and then we say we completely throw open our our entire trade, then how do you expect Indian ship owners at all to really you know uh, have their footing? That's a very strong indictment. Uh, Julian, the Musk company has flagged in different countries uh, all over the world. They're not solely a Danish company. They do have ships under different flags. But unfortunately, India doesn't find its place in one. Now, we've heard 42% from, uh, from Deepak. We've heard a, another thing from uh, the former chairman of SCI, the former INSA president, and the INSA president himself about this not being a very friendly thing. Which are the flags that you find friendly? And why are they more friendly than the Indian? I think the first observation I'd make is, is that one has to be slightly careful about using um, majority terminology like friendly or, or not. That, that I think is, is, is emotion. Um, to understand what's really driving all of this, one has to look at the state of the industry, and whether it's containers or whatever, as things sit now. And generally speaking, it is a very tough place. The result of that is that people are spending a huge amount of time focusing on costs, 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 and to contribute to that, economy of scale. Um, so it's an economic argument. Um, we are, as April Mullen Merced, exactly the same as MSC. Um, we'd be very keen to, to, to look at this country. We have a lot of Indian <laughs> seafarers, we have a lot of Indian cadets, we have lots of other involvement here. But going on to what you're saying just now, the economics of flagging here are not, are, are simply, the numbers don't stack up. Where do they stack up? Places like Singapore, places like the United Kingdom, um, and there are a number of other flags around the world which everybody in this group knows about. Why do they work? Um, they work because the numbers stack up. There are economies that you can achieve by, by flagging in those, in those states. Um, and the process whereby that one has to go through to achieve that flag status is, is straightforward. Um, I think, having said at the outset that, that one has to be careful of emotional arguments, um, there is an emotional content to this debate, and that is that, unfortunately, with all deference to the gentleman on my left, um, there is a perception uh, that it's difficult to flag in this country. 
And over time, perceptions, as everybody knows, become reality. Um, and that's an issue that we have to address as well. And therefore, in changing the way in which flagging in this country works, um, I think the, the, the government in this country will have to think about A, the numbers, B, the process, and C, the perception that all of that makes um, in the eyes of, of ship owners overseas. And unless those, those, those issues are, are dealt with, um, I think we're, we're frankly, we're, we're not going to make a lot of progress. I would add that the suggestion has been brought up already in this conversation about cargo reservation. Um, I think one has to be careful of that. Um, I would certainly subscribe to the view that the best regulator of all is the marketplace. Um, I think that's a very important point. I'm glad you've made it. I see sitting here in the audience one of the biggest ship owners and the best known names in the shipping industry, Kanubai, shared this here. Now, Kanubai himself has a very large uh, company, but some of them are flagged out. Can you get a mic here? Some of them are flagged out. You can use this one. Just get that mic. So, Kanubai, would you like to tell us what is it that has made you uh, flag out? What is it that you see lacking in the Indian flag? How do you think we can overcome this? What do you think should be the next steps? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, as far as shipping is concerned, we have not flagged out. Uh, but offshore fleet, we have decided to flag out for a variety of reasons. Uh, Hearing the dialogue that was going on on the tires, let me point out, as they say in English, there is a saying, where there is a will, there is a way. Unfortunately, I find from the government side, it is lacking the will for the growth of Indian shipping. When India got independence, the general manager of Sindhya Steam Navigation, Mr. Namechand Sarabhai Haji, introduced a bill in the parliament for reservation of coastal shipping. And under that Merchant Shipping Act, it was only meant for uh, the Indian ship, for the growth of Indian shipping. Uh, unfortunately, over a period of time, uh, that was not observed. We have permitted foreign ships also to trade on the coast. And the very spirit of introduction of the uh, Merchant Shipping Act has got defeated. Uh, as far as the carriage of cargo and participation by the Indian fleet is concerned, in 1987-88, Indian fleet used to carry nearly 40.7 percent of the Indian and uh, uh, of the import and export trade of the country. Today, the trade has, the import export trade has grown by almost 20 to 25 million tons, whereas the participation by the Indian line has gone down to 8%. Now, why this is so? Because there is not enough encouragement from the government side for the growth of Indian shipping. And if the, we are today, I'm sorry to say, but Indian shipping is functioning uh, like the orphans. We have no father, no mother to back us. And there is no encouragement from the government side for the growth of shipping. As you know, sir, that government introduced tonnage tax after the Indian shipping industry battling for a couple of years. They introduced tonnage tax from 1st April 2004. This was with a view to encourage the growth of Indian shipping. And Indian shipping that time, thinking that now we have achieved what we wanted, did grow. It grew by almost 15%. But thereafter, due to lack of coordination between the finance ministry and the shipping ministry, they went on introducing different type of taxes. With the result that today, Indian shipping is functioning with nearly 12 to 13 additional taxes in addition to the tonnage tax with the result that globally 
Indian shipping, government has made sure that uh, globally Indian shipping is not competitive. We are not asking, mind you, <coughs> let me point out, we are not asking for any favors from the government. All that they are, we are saying, if you want Indian shipping to grow globally, please put us on par with foreign shipping. Then only we can, we are very confident we will be able to compete with the global shipping, but provided we are put on par with the global shipping. Otherwise, it's not possible. I think that's very fair. Uh, let me turn again to the panel. Now, if uh, a fairy godmother were to come and say, look, you've been a very good boy all these years, so let me give you three wishes. Atul, if these three wishes were given to you, what would you like Deepak Shetty to do? Three most important things. Would be to give 100% cabotage on the Indian coast. That's number one. Number two, permit Indian ship owners to fly a flag of their choice in spite of owning the tonnage in India. That, will, that is the way the world does and that is how the Indian owned tonnage will grow. See, we somehow have got a fixation that Indian owned tonnage should also fly the Indian flag. That in my view is not a very fair way in which you should deal. Worldwide you are permitted to fly a flag of your choice. That's the way shipping operates worldwide. So I should be have a choice of flying a flag of my choice. I think these two things only if the government takes, not even three, it would be good enough to start India growing. And just to make a point here, I think the Indian government is missing a point. When Gale wants 14 gas carriers on hire or to be built and giving a contract for 15 years, the government of India should have insisted that all 14 would fly only the Indian flag. If any foreigner wants to operate these vessels, they are free. But please come into India, form a subsidiary over here, which is which can be 100 percent owned by them, but fly the Indian flag, which the government is not doing. I think that is something which is very important. Imagine 14 gas carriers on the Indian knowledge. Imagine the soft skills that everyone in India would develop. That's the way every the world operates. Can you go in, in, in Brazil and fly on the coast without flying the Brazilian flag? The answer is no. So why should we allow? How will we develop the soft skills? How will there be growth of the ancillary industry in India? There cannot be unless we do these things. Yeah, but on the specific point, I think you've made a very valid point. On the specific point of the gas carriers, uh, Ajara Sahib, what would you say about this? Should there be reserve for the Indian flag? Should there be an open competition? Is there any economic argument that can be advanced against reserving it for the Indian flag? No, I mean, I would address one point that uh, you know Atul mentioned is very right there that Indian owners he says should be free to flag anywhere just like many other countries. Now let us ask ourselves a question that why would Indian owner based in India having their shareholders in India they have to serve the shareholders based in India why would they at all think of flagging it out? The, that very thought would come only because if that flag is not competitive vis-a-vis -vis another flag, of course they should be free to free to flag there. Or, or of course there is of course there is another very very distinct reason why the Indian flag uh, ship owners are required to flag out. That is, if anyone is operating in Brazil, anyone is operating, you know, in Indonesia, either the gas carriers or the uh, you know coastal, I mean, the offshore vessels they have to necessarily flag there because otherwise they won't have any access to that so they then should definitely be allowed to flag it there because otherwise they have not, no access but the basic thing is if we make our flag competitive enough and our flag I mean uh, Julian had a point about not using the word uh, friendly but our flag you know, at par with other flag in terms of the ease of doing business. I take just uh, for, uh, for a second uh, Deepak, I mean Deepak Shetty's point. Yes, it's a fact that India is way down when it comes to ease of doing business, you know, in general. But that hasn't stopped, as I think Atul again mentioned, that hasn't stopped our, from, I mean, our telecom industry, our automobile parts industry, all this to grow, despite the environment being here. Because at least for that industry, we could make it somewhat facilitative regime. So if we make it for shipping, despite the overall 
scenario, even the shipping industry in India will grow. Yeah, I, uh, but, but the question I asked was whether, uh, in uh, the view of the audience here, it would make sense to reserve the, the, the new uh, energy control for India and whether that has any economic consequences. I got an, an answer that was, you know, we must empower people. <laughs> Come, well, I, I saw a hand up there, can I, yes, Professor, you. <laughs> yeah, but that wasn't the question I asked. <laughs> You know, there were two or three students going for an exam, and they said, we haven't prepared at all. And then one of them said, don't worry, if I get a question, I don't know the answer to it. I just said, we must empower women. Good morning, sir. Uh, I'm Captain Dinesh Gautam, President of Navkar Corporation, uh, former Vice Chairman of Container Shipping Lines, former Director, former, 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 former. Yes, we have a fantastic panel today. Fantastic is the reason that we got an Indian ship owner, a foreign ship owner, a foreign ship operator, you got a former uh, regulator, and you got a present regulator. Now, what's the problem? Because I just heard that 100% FDI is allowed. I know about it. 100% FDI is allowed. Excepting that when you come to register the vessel in India, say it's a barge or a crane or something like that, you, they'll be asked, you please register it under the uh, Coasting Vessels Act of 1838. Modern ship owner coming to register and he's told 1838. What's the problem in Indian shipping? What the main thing is, let's try to at least change the laws. Let's try to change the laws. You bring a ship into India, you know you can't sail out. You can't sail out from there. Until you tell the captain, captain, you make sure pay everything before you clear the cargo. If you don't clear the cargo, get hold of somebody who will pay for it. And that will be his agent. We've got cases in the Supreme Court in 1972 when the cargo landed. And today it is 2014 and the case is still going on. Why? For 5,000 rupees. 5,000 rupees is in the Supreme Court till today. Why? Because we could not define 1963's definition of what is owner of cargo. 1963. We got Major Port Trust Act 1963, we got the Customs Act 1962, we got the Merchant Shipping Act 1958, we got the Indian uh, Lighthouse Act of 1927, we got the Coast Carriage of Goods by Sea Act of 1925, we got the Indian, Vess Indian uh, uh, Vessels Act, that is the Inland Vessels Act of 1917, we got the Indian Ports Act of 1908, we got the Bill of Lading Act of 1856, we got the Coasting Vessels Act of 1838. How old do you want to go? Signed at the right time of Badur Shah Zafar. So please, we need to update all this. I think the moment you do that, there will be some change. Yes. I think you made an important point, we'll keep that for Deepak to answer. But I saw a hand up there. Uh, Ashok Chattopadhyay wants to come. Yes, my Ashok Chattopadhyay, very senior man, and the chairman of Confidential Shipping. I had a personal experience with this early vessel of SCI, because of we, our company, along with the German counterpart, we have helped Petronet for the design, commercial, all, all aspects, which now they say is running. I do agree with Mr. Agrawal, that Gail should have all those 14 challenges in Indian Indian flag and this can be done. Will there be any effect on the on the freight, on the economy, on the, no. the, the whole shipping population? is very international. Okay, shipping is I, very international. Yeah, I didn't react that time because I didn't want to you know I mean say something that uh, would appear that you know I'm not in favor of Indian flagging of any ship, but still let me since I would like mention that, let me mention. You see, you cannot do it only for Gale because if you have allowed Petronet, if you have allowed Shell to bring in their LNG by foreign flag vessel into India, then Gale will pose the same question to us that you shipping industry, you are asking for level playing field. So how, how do you feel that Gale will have a level playing field vis-a-vis -vis Petronet? So I would agree with uh, Tool completely. But I would agree that it should have been done when the decision was taken for the first time with Petronet. That that time itself there should have been an agreement that all the LNG vessels I mean, bringing, uh, coming uh, with LNG to India, they should have been Indian flag. Sir, it is almost like this. Since I goofed up my first interview, I should never have had a job. If I made a mistake in the past, that does not mean I can correct, cannot correct myself today. So I goofed my first interview. You will never ever get a job in your life. <laughs> but uh, the point uh, I think comes back, and I think it's a very valid point. If you've not done it in the case of uh, of uh, Petronet, you've not done it in the case of uh, Shell, can you do it only in the case of Gate? But let me pose another question. If we haven't done it in those two, is there any reason why we can't do it now? 
If it is such a good thing to do, if everyone agrees that preserving uh, the movement of energy to the Indian flag, preempting it for the Indian flag, is, is this such a good thing to do? Then why don't we do it even retrospectively now? We can tell them, okay, you've done it in the past. If you've got long-term agreements, we'll allow those to run through, but after that, you have to come to the Indian flag. Anyway, we are known to amend the laws in retrospectively. We are good at that. Deepak? And especially the taxes. Um, so, we are talking about cargo reservation. Have we asked our, uh, asked our cargo owners, the exporters and importers, have you asked them whether they are happy with this? Let me tell you that we, as MSE, when we go to the public sector undertakings around India, they are very frustrated. And they would love to give cargo to us by any way, which way means they possibly can. And they do. They find a way to give us cargo, foreign flag. Why? Because of the preference. What is the preference? As Julian said, economics. Now, if you are going to impose on the Indian trade, that is the Indian exporter, the manufacturer, the importer, you do have to pay higher just because we want to increase our, uh, our we want to protect our Indian flag. I think we are uh, thinking in a, in a different uh, uh, light altogether. We have an option to scrap 100% FDI and say, there's going to be no FDI in India, thank you very much in shipping, and we continue the way we were in 1945. Or, we open it up as the intention was, we open it up in reality and then give a competitive edge to our Indian trade, our Indian exporters and our Indian importers. Yeah, I saw a hand raised there. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jonathan Beard, ICFGHK, based in Hong Kong. Um, I was just going to echo Captain Tuari's comments. I think you've got to separate the flag issue, but clearly flagging the India flag should be done because it's attractive. And I would support all the measures that people are talking about and making it attractive. Reservation and cabotage to me is going to be the wrong direction. Shipping is a derived demand. It is there to meet the needs of importers and exporters. Importers and exporters don't generate demand so that Indian flag vessels can move cargo. They generate demand for markets and they want those goods to be moved as efficiently as possible. You mentioned Indonesia. Well, in my view, their cabotage restrictions are their loss because what it's doing is supporting inefficient domestic shipping. And if you look at the rates for domestic movements of containers in Indonesia, they're catastrophic. If you look in China, it's largely helped prop up China shipping and Costco, and it stopped some of the big China ports going into transshipment. That is a side issue. The point is, shipping is a derived demand need to market need, and it should be able to compete by making the changes you suggest. By, by putting in reservations of cabotage, in my view, all you do is damage your importers and your exporters. And that's the ultimate objective, getting costs down for Indian exporters and importers, not protecting shipping. Shipping should be protecting itself because it's competitive meeting the needs of importers and exporters. Since we're on this topic, I notice uh, in the audience uh, Dr. Joe Sport, who's written extensively on cabotage. Would you like to say something on this subject um, in the light of what uh, Jonathan Mayer has just said? No, no, just give that right here, then right next to On cabotage, I would like to mention that if a country shipping tonnage in a particular sector is deficient, then there is justification for permitting foreign shipping lines to lift container cargo, only containers, along the coast. There have been examples in New Zealand where there has been a great debate whether the domestic shipping should be thrown open to foreign shipping lines. 
a study concluded that the national economy would be better if greater competition is introduced. After five years, there was a great debate that it should be reversed. Another committee was appointed. And that categorically mentioned that national interests would not be better served if this 